Hey everybody. So welcome to chapter 11, building and managing effective teams. So last chapter we talked about kind of hiring people, which is I guess part of building our teams. And, and now we'll talk about how we actually build those and manage those teams. So uh, much of the work that's done today uh, in the world, not all, not all organizations run this way, but many run in work groups. Um, and a lot of people believe that this is a superior way to do uh, to do stuff. Um, you'll also see classes that are run in, in sort of accountability groups where people kind of report to their own group. Um, again, not everybody loves group work. <laughs> in fact, most people don't like it, but um, there's some real values of work groups and those are up there on the screen. Um, the big one is that groups tend to kind of control one another's behavior and allow more problem solving because you have groups um, but then there's also this issue of groupthink, and I think anybody who's ever served on a committee uh, or say like a student council or something like that has been involved in seeing groupthink where there tends to be group pressures uh, that sort of lead and guide things or sometimes one person kind of dominates the group. Um, and so groups don't always make the best decisions either. So we have to guard against groupthink. So here are some I guess, concepts or ideas uh, of what highly cohesive work groups do. Okay, typically they're small. They, um, try to pick out some of the ones that I think are really important from what I've seen. They tend to um, form due to outside pressures. They have members who communicate easily among themselves. But you'll also see that there's things like this where they have they they perceive themselves as having a higher status than other employees, um, you know. So so they feel like what they're doing is important and that they're recognized. So that's not always a good thing. And what I mean by that is, we want some you know most places are egalitarian. They want people to all you know feel equal. But good groups often kind of feel special. They feel like they're special, doing meaningful, important things that give them a status. And so. Trying to balance that can be challenging. All right, so there's a few types of work groups. The first is what's called a command group. Um, and so that's where we group people together according to the relationships in the organization chart, or in other words, their chains of command, okay? Sometimes there's what's called a task group or a cross-functional team. This is where we bring people from, ac from across areas in the organizational chart, but based on sort of the knowledge and skill sets they have to accomplish a particular uh, task or particular function. Then there's these friendship groups, which are often informal and they kind of just develop uh, as employees with similar ideas and personalities sort of work together. Um, and sometimes they're brought together by a command task group saying this, we need you to, this group to do this. And other times they just sort of form um, naturally. And so good managers, if they see those sorts of groups form, will leverage them, right? Use them um, for the things that they would be good at. And then special interest groups. So these are groups of people who have, um, have a special interest that they're sort of attacking. So they exist to accomplish something in a group that individuals do not choose to pursue individually. Um, all right. So some insight from research. So there's just a few slides here, it's actually several, okay, that talk about the research on work groups and why maybe they're not always a bad thing. So, so one's called the Hawthorne Studies, okay? And they found that groups affect and control behaviors of individual members through what's called group norms, just the expectation of the group. And this actually works better than just trying to make rules to have people do things a certain way. You probably have recognized this as you've been part of groups that when you're new to the group, you sort of show up and you watch for cues from everybody else on what's expected and what's normal. Um, and so then the group itself sort of regulates the behavior. This can be good or bad. Sometimes you have a wild group that uh, you know has a, a group norm of kind of messing around and, and not getting the work done. And so you may have to adjust those groups um, to develop those norms. So team research by Katzenbach and Smith, team members must be committed to the group and to the performance of the group. 
or otherwise they won't be effective. Teams function better when they're small. By small, they mean 10 or fewer members. They should be composed of individuals who have skills that are complementary and sufficient to deal with the problem. And finally, teams should be committed to the objectives uh, that are specific and realistic. So don't give them too much uh, latitude. Uh, is, so again, so that's what the, these guys, Katzenbach and Smith, found out when they researched what made effective work teams. They also found that to develop a high performance team that supervisors need to understand the process of managing teams. In other words, it's not an automatic thing for supervisors to just know what to do. They need to be coached uh, to help these teams um, and people in the team need to be held accountable for their actions. So you can't just do nothing and, and let the rest of the group do it. That's why people always take group work assignments, right? They feel like one or two people do all the work. So, uh, and then finally, um, the group development process. So Tuckman and Jensen, this has been around a long time, um, this research, but they said that small groups go through these five stages, forming, storming, norming, performing, and adjourning. <laughs> That doesn't quite rhyme, Tuckman and Jensen, but forming just as like that initial stage where everybody's getting to know each other, people are a little bit nervous. So at that point, the group is sort of uh, performing at a low level. Um, uh, and also, you know, they're, they're just sort of trying to figure each other out. Then they go through storming where people start sort of getting to know each other and getting annoyed with each other. And so the skill level doesn't grow much, but at the same time, um, the, the group dynamic starts to develop and then it goes into the norming phase where we start to have growth in the performance of the group. Um, people are getting along better because they've sort of figured out uh, everybody's personalities. And then finally performing where you kind of optimize, everybody knows the job, knows one another, understands the strengths and weaknesses of one another and they're all working together. And a lot of times when that happens, the group could, it, you know, the, the group is performing at a level that's higher than the individuals of the group could have performed at, you know, individually. And then finally adjourning when the group just goes through this phase of saying like, okay, we're done with this. Like either the task ends or the group's ability to be as effective as they used to be starts to wane. And then we look at what we can do to either extend the life of that and get them back into a performing phase, or uh, if there's a better option. The idea I mentioned where the interaction of the group is better than the, than the it's gonna provide more output or better performance than each individual is called the synergistic effect. And I won't read the teamwork to you. I think you know what teamwork means. And a collaborative workplace is just a workplace where it's normal for people to do things together, joint decision-making, shared accountability, et cetera. So again, this is kind of some review, uh, some keys to effective work teams. I won't read them all to you, um, but recognize that for teams to be effective, it really requires active participation from all the members people who are committed to the process. Decisions are actually made by consensus. Have you ever been on one of those teams where they let everybody talk, but then the same boss always just makes the decision for everyone anyway? That's frustrating and it will not make for an effective team. People will just, just kind of check out and say, you're gonna make the decision anyway, so go ahead. So I'll let you read the rest of those, but those are some key points. Um, there's a few more on this page. Um, I think again, Ultimately, for a team to be effective, uh, the, the team has to be cohesive, meaning people feel like they can talk with one another, they feel like they can trust one another, and that if they share something, even if people don't agree, they probably won't get attacked, right? People might share their disagreement, but people have to feel trust, you know, trusted and that they can say things without with trust as well. Um, and I mean, and ultimately, we want people to be proud of being on the team and what the team can accomplish. All right, so this kind of transitions us from just talking about teams, but to virtual teams. So the COVID era, and actually 
I don't know, really, COVID really expanded this. There were virtual teams well before COVID, but this is really, really, because I think employers are figuring out it's cheaper, right? You don't have to worry about housing everybody in offices. You can just get them on Zoom or get them on Microsoft Teams and they can work from anywhere. So, so the best thing though, these 12 principles that help make virtual teams work, again, I won't read all of them, but the first one is that you need to get people together physically early on. This says or at least by video conference. I don't personally believe that's enough. People need some to meet together sometimes. There's value in that. Um, people need to understand not just the roles, but also what processes and tasks, whose jobs are what, what jobs are left open for people to sort of work on individually, or which ones are we going to work on more as groups. Um, we have to create a place where people will communicate outside of the official channels. What I mean by that is if you think about your family or you think about places you've worked, a lot of good stuff gets done not in the official meeting, you know, the family gathering meeting or something, but a lot of good stuff happens around the dinner table and a lot of good stuff happens while you're out working in the yard together. And in a workplace, a lot of good stuff happens in the break room or in the hallway when you run into somebody and you, you're talking about an issue that you're facing and, and you find solutions. And so you need something like that virtually. And it's really hard because if you do like a discussion board, nobody wants to go on the discussion board. So you've got to free, you know, create some sort of way for people to communicate informally. Um, and ultimately, right? We need to find a way for every member of a virtual team to feel included fully in the whole team. And that can be challenging because you're just not getting the same level of contact as you get in a face, I mean, a, an in-person uh, team. So this applies, it's always applied. We've always wanted to maintain employee morale and engagement, but it's especially important now in a world where there's you know, so many people working individually uh, and in silos. So morale just means how people feel about where they work. And we want to have good morale where people feel good um, about the organization they work for. Um, so how do we improve that? So there's external factors and internal factors that influence morale. And again, think of some of these. If people aren't happy in their family relationships, if they're having financial difficulties, if they're having health problems, then those things are going to affect their morale. Even if they love where they were, it's hard to focus on work or feel very good about going to work when you're struggling with things at home. So that's one side of the morale equation. We can't always do a lot about that other than be supportive of people as they work through these problems. Then there's internal factors like compensation. How much people get paid does impact how they feel about where they work. Job security, right? If people are afraid of getting laid off, then they don't feel great about work, et cetera. Again, I won't read them all to you, but you, you can imagine that we have to remember the people we supervise are people with real lives, right? And so we want to be not only give them a great place to work, but help them to know that we care about them enough to give them time off if they have a sick family member or, um, you know, be understanding when they have a vehicle breakdown instead of being like, well, if you don't get here in time, you know you're going to be fired, right? Like, so recognize that with all of the people that we work with, there are both external and internal factors that affect their morale. Recognize that we live in a culture of downsizing. Business is always trying to like sort of make do with less, including fewer employees. The problem with that is when people work in a place that is constantly cutting jobs, they're nervous and they don't feel, feel good about working there. And so some things you can do to help, you can't fix the problem, okay, um, is when this says the after effects of downsizing, but I'll say there are pre effects of downsizing too. The rumors start happening and everybody's afraid and wondering if they're going to have enough to buy Christmas presents for their kids this year. But giving good, uh, good communication about what jobs have been eliminated and why they've been eliminated, right? 
especially if you can do that early. So people who are in those jobs can start to make plans, whether that's looking for a new job, whether that's retraining within the same organization, and then work with the people that are still there to help them, um, you know, one, reassure them that you're not trying to target their job, and two, to help them to, to do the new jobs or the jobs that have changed because of the downsizing. So how do we tell if people are engaged? We've all been to businesses where you see employees who are not engaged. They're there, maybe they're even dealing with customers, but they're, they're you know, only their body's there, their brain is barely there. So things we can do to assess employee engagement is of course we can observe and study. Sometimes that's called management by walking around. Right. If you uh, are a store director for Walmart, it would be valuable for you to walk around your store, see how people are, maybe even walk around not really looking like the manager, right? Just kind of come in there and go shopping outside of your regular workday. See how people are engaged, how they're working with customers, how they're getting their job done. Um, you can also do engagement surveys. Sometimes asking people how engaged they are or how they engaged they feel or how engaged they perceive other people are can be valuable. We can do exit interviews. When people are leaving, we can try to figure out why they're leaving. Are they just leaving because they got a better job somewhere else? Are they leaving because they're unhappy? If we start to see lots of people leaving because they're unhappy, we may have to address some things. You can do attitude surveys, get a sense of how people feel about what's going on in the organization. And you can do organizational development. So again, uh, a lot of times you actually hire in somebody who's neutral, they're not management, you know, and they're just there to, to talk about how people feel and what can be done about it. But if you've ever been on the other side of this as an employee, you know, if it's not done well, it can be pretty annoying, right? Like they just are like, we're gonna have a mandatory meeting. And you're like, ugh not another meeting. Um, and so all of these, and or you have to take this survey and you're like, this survey is dull. And so as managers, think about what life is when you're an employee, right? Recognize that your efforts to find out more about what's going on can sometimes be seen as spying uh, by the employees and try to be the sort of manager where they know that you are genuinely trying to improve the situation for them and not just trying to you know, drive profits. Now, hopefully when everybody's happy, that will also improve profits, but recognize that people really aren't means to your own ends. People are people and they have real lives and real feelings. Just a couple more. Recognize that also as a counselor, we, uh, I mean, a supervisor, we also have a counseling role, um, which means rather than like, you know, just being the boss, uh, we want to hear people's problems out. A lot of times people will turn to people they respect. So be the kind of person who can develop a relationship with their employees and help them through personal problems. Don't be the whole like, I'm just running this business. I don't actually have time for you. Because if, if that's the way you are, then you're going to have low engagement. People are just going to show up to work, do the minimum and leave. If they know you care about them, um, they'll give you more. And unfortunately, the cost of them knowing you care about them is for you to actually care about them and help them with their challenges and be part of their life. Recognize that there's a law, the Family Medical Leave Act, that requires larger employers to give people leave when they have medical or other, um, other issues, okay? So, and then outside of the law, so this is only for employers with 50 or more employees, Many smaller businesses also try to find ways to provide that to their employees. It's unpaid leave. Some employers will say, well, we're gonna give you paid leave to deal with these things, right? Um, but it can be really hard on a small employer to have to replace an employee for 30 days or something. Nonetheless, it's part of supporting and helping people and in the long-term having a good relationship. Um, and then, uh, we also have things called employee assistance programs. Uh, where I work, they have those. So if people are struggling with um, some of the things you see there on the list, there's people you can talk to, right? And so our health insurance covers getting counseling. Uh, we have financial, financial counseling available through our retirement plans, et, et cetera. 
And finally, wellness programs. So it's in addition to being able to help people when they're struggling, um, programs that help people to avoid struggling, right? And so that whether that be exercise or uh, health insurance benefits or other things like that, having those things in place can really uh, help people feel supported um, and then paid time off, right? Again, it's hard for a small business to afford that, but again, having a people have the opportunity to say, man, when I have these struggles, I can take time off of work to go take care of them and I'm still getting paid. Again, that goes a long way to boosting morale and helping people feel like uh, they're not just a number, but they're actually cared for by the organization. Anyway, so that's it for chapter 11. Um, this is a big, big topic. And, and you know, I, I think we're coming out of an era where there was a mindset of sort of like seeing people as numbers, um, in, especially in big, you know, people would talk about the corporate, you know, structures and things like that. And it's just, it's counterproductive. I mean, ultimately, if you don't recognize that the people you work with and who work for you are people, then the chances of you running a successful business is, is low. And so anyway, I hope this was interesting and I hope the, the rest of the work of this chapter is, is interesting and valuable to you. And I hope you have a great week.